let's talk about what is muscle protein synthesis, what is the role of leucine, and, and, and I also wanna even dive deeper into that, which is how does the body preserve leucine? What do leucine levels look like during the course of a day in response to a meal, a fast, et cetera? A great question. So um, muscle protein synthesis is basically what it sounds like. It is the, the synthesis of muscle proteins um, from amino acid substrates. And uh, you know, you can separate it in terms of like what you look at in research. You can, you can do what's called mixed muscle protein synthesis, which is what we did, which is where you're literally taking the entirety of a muscle and you're grinding it up and you're homogenizing it. And then you're, you're basically using, in the studies, we use stable isotopes to assess this. We used uh, D5 phenylalanine, which is basically a, a deuterated, uh, one of the hydrogens on the phenylalanine is deuterated. And you can, basically you're looking at how much of that label gets incorporated into the, the mixed muscle of the, of the, or sorry, the mixed muscle. Um, versus how much is in the precursor pool, which is the intracellular fluid. Um, and that rate divided by a time factor will tell you what the rate of muscle protein synthesis is. Um, and on a kind of a more broad level, protein synthesis starts in your DNA because your DNA codes for those proteins that are going to be synthesized. So for example, let's say you go and you would do a resistance training session. We know that in response to resistance training, you have an increase in muscle protein synthesis. That resistance training is triggering something, uh, it's probably a cascade of things, that are telling your DNA, we need to adapt to this stressor. So we are going to increase the transcription of these you know, specific DNA sequences to the messenger, R I'm, I'm, and I'm really, really abbreviating this. Um, because you can get the introns, extrons, mRNA degradation, all this kind of stuff. But it gets trans, uh, transcribed to an mRNA sequence, which is then read by a ribosome. And that ribosome, based on the mRNA, is going to bring amino acids in and hook them together to build these new proteins. So in the case of, you know, let's say you go and you, you do resistance training, you know, myosin, actin, these contractile proteins, you're going to need those as part of your um, adaptation to that stressor. And so those are going to be some of the things that are going to be built during muscle protein synthesis. Now, my work specifically was uh, in, in animals, and, I, and I'll tell you why, and you kind of alluded to it earlier. So we actually, I have a, um, a research review that's going to be coming out on my website. One of the things I'm very proud of is we have a 50-page guide on how to read research. And we have a Venn diagram in there. And in the Venn diagram, we have highly controlled, high subject number, long duration. And what you find is the only way you can get all those to overlap is if you do animal studies. So if you want, if you want tightly controlled and a high subject number, it's gonna be really short in humans. If you want um, long duration, uh, uh, and, and tightly controlled, it's going to be very few subjects. If you want, you know, and you, yeah. you can kind of get the gist of it. So for, I decided I wanted to do animals because I was more kind of interested in, in finding out the mechanisms of this stuff. Um, and so, you know, you can do, one of the reasons I liked using rats was one, they're a good model for human protein metabolism. A lot of the stuff in rats has then been validated in humans. There are some differences. Um, but I can teach a, a rat, I can teach a rat to meal feed, meaning they, they eat discrete meals. Um, I can get them to eat what I want them to eat, and then I can measure what I want to measure, and I can poke and prod them and do all that kind of stuff as long as it's okay with the IO cook, which is basically the IRB for, for animals. Um, and so what, what we were interested in was what you kind of talked about, like how important is leucine? Because at that time, the, you know, the mid 2000s, um, there had been quite a bit of work done by my advisor, Dr. Don Lehman, as well as the Penn State group, which was uh, Leonard Jefferson and Scott Kimball, uh, looking at, okay, we know if we give purified solutions of leucine, they increase mTOR activity and we see an increase in muscle protein synthesis. But one, what does that mean for complete meals where you have protein, carbohydrate, and fat? 
What does it mean in the context of different protein sources? And then what does it actually even matter for uh, tissue weights, right? Like do you actually actually see differences in, 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 in actual tissue? And so one of the, some of the work we did was one, we looked at the duration of muscle protein synthesis in response to uh, a complete meal. Um, and that was really interesting. Actually, that was one of the things I was dead wrong about what I thought I was gonna see versus what I actually saw. Um, and so we saw like even with weight, so whey protein, which is thought of as a fast protein, um, basically we saw an increase in muscle protein synthesis that peaked at 90 minutes post meal and then by 180 minutes or three hours had gone back down to baseline, which has since been validated in humans. That, that's about what we see in humans as well. Now, now um, Lane, let me just ask you a question there for a second before you go further. Um, do we have a sense of after the training stimulus ends, how long that transcriptional stress is in place to continue muscle protein synthesis provided enough substrate is available? In other words, when do we become substrate available? Uh, substrate limited, I'm sorry. So this is really interesting because it's so hard to assess. Because, so part of the reason that this stuff is so hard to measure is in humans, you basically have to have a steady state in order to measure muscle protein synthesis because there's certain assumptions you have to make about the isotope that you're, you're using to assess it, the precursor pool, and the, the actual protein bound um, label. And so that requires what we call a nutritional steady state. So if you want to assess like muscle protein synthesis in response to exercise, you're going yeah, to well, confound that. Yeah, but let's say you could give somebody an intravenous infusion of all amino acids. So I guess there'd be two questions, right? We start with one question, which is we don't care which amino acid is, but we'll give you enough of all of them so that you're not going to be limited by a given amino acid. And then we're just going to give you an IV infusion. So the second you finish the highest stress workout, we just keep running it out. And then we're tracking over time muscle protein synthesis. That would be one experiment that would be interesting. And then the second one would be playing with which amino acids um, are, are the most important there. Does that kind of make sense? So we kind of have a pretty good idea of like the time course of muscle protein synthesis in response to an exercise bout. Okay when it comes to mixed muscle protein synthesis. Okay. Okay, so, so I'm, I'm gonna make a very important caveat here in a second. And it appears to be pretty similar for, uh, or sorry, so the peak, so the, the change percentage is about, it increases, it's different from study to study, but um, about 100 to 150% increase in muscle protein synthesis. That, pe that, that peak is about the same for trained versus untrained, but the untrained duration lasts much longer. So it it's still not back to baseline in studies by 48, well, some studies it's back to baseline at 48 hours, in other studies there's still a statistical difference at 48 hours. So we think basically in untrained people, it's about 48 to 72 hour response. The interesting thing is in trained people, that, initial robust response comes back down about 10 to 12 hours and at 24 hours is basically not different from baseline. So this is, now that's for mixed muscle protein synthesis. Now here's the rub for myofibrillar protein synthesis because you can separate that out during your analysis. So we're talking about actual contractile muscle proteins because Mixed muscle protein synthesis included, includes all cytoplasmic mm -hmm. proteins, mitochondrial proteins, all these sorts of things. Mi uh, the myofibrillar protein synthesis, they actually don't know how long it lasts because they've only assessed it up to 16 hours post. And so far, neither group has returned to baseline, although they have assessed the area under the curve and it's, a, it's greater area under the curve for untrained versus trained. Now. The rub on that is if we look at, I know you're asking about nutrient availability. And no, I no, we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll keep, keep going with this point though. Um, the rub on that is none of these are addressing the other side of protein balance, which is protein degradation. Now, what's really interesting is during the first approximately six weeks of resistance training, you don't see much hypertrophy 
in people who are training. You see strength improvements, but you don't really see hypertrophy. And what's really interesting is in the initial kind of phases of training, you have an increase, a robust increase in muscle protein synthesis, but you also have a very robust increase in protein degradation. And so the thought process is because this is such a big stressor, a massive stressor, if you've never resisted training before, I mean, everybody knows like the first time they went and did a leg workout, you couldn't walk for like a you know, few days after that. You have to completely, it's almost like your muscles doing a complete overhaul of those, of those proteins. And so you have such a robust degradatory response because there are so many damaged proteins or, or proteins that need to be, I guess, improved that it's almost like you're, you're doing this protein turnover feudal cycle um, kind of remodeling. And then what we see is after six weeks, that at the end of six weeks, that increase in degradation goes way down. And that's actually, I mean, again, I can't say for certain, but that coincides with when we start seeing the big improvements in hypertrophy.